The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the most important function in our life, and that is the metabolization of Bible doctrine. We ask that God the Holy Spirit will give us the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the Word of God into our stream of consciousness so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, on the lighter side of things today, I came across some funny quotes from some famous people in the past and some people we know today. <clears throat> Here's one from Oscar Wilder. I am so clever that sometimes I don't, under I don't understand a single word that I'm saying. Here's one from W.C. Fields. I once spent a year in Philadelphia. I think it was on a Sunday. Now, if you don't live in that area, you wouldn't understand. I went to New Jersey. That is one weird place. Had to go through Philadelphia. And spending one day in Philadelphia, it did feel like I was there a year. Then we have Jay Leno. That's someone that we know. He put his arms around some actor you or actress you probably know. I don't have any idea. Nigella Lawson. And then he said, my wife's going to kill me. But you look like my wife, so that's okay. Then we have a quote from Jerry Seinfeld. Where lipstick is concerned, the important thing is not color but to accept God's final word on where your lips end. Then we have Mel, Mel Brooks who said, uh, I've always been a huge admirer of my own work. I'm one of the funniest and most entertaining men around. And then uh, from we have some quotes from there. And then we, I have this joke that I read. And since we're... The political season is heating up. It's just a joke, so I'm not endorsing anyone or anything like that. It's just a joke. And the joke is about Palin and Obama. And they were riding on Air Force One together discussing some things. And Barack Obama and Sarah Palin were sitting beside each other. And Obama thought that, uh, well, he had the idea that Palin may be a bit of a redneck, being up from Alaska. And he, and Obama thinking this, uh, he came up with an idea to where he says, I'm going to make some easy money, and I'm going to trick her into playing this game. So he told her, he said, hey, let's, let's play some game. It's boring up here flying along. If I ask you a question and you don't know it, then you pay me $5. If I don't know one of your questions, I'll pay you $500. And I guess that's to exemplify the fact that Obama's all-knowing. So Palin agreed, and Obama began the game by asking, How many miles is it from the sun to Jupiter? Not knowing, Palin paid him $5. Then it was Palin's turn, so she asked Obama, What goes up a hill with three legs and comes down with four? After long hours of researching and consulting every one of his advisors and czars, he finally gave up and he paid the $500 to Palin. Then Obama said, Well, what's the answer? 
What goes up the hill with three legs and comes down with four? Palin handed him five dollars. <laughs> well, we can start with a little bit of fun and frivolity because uh, we are dealing with the serious subject of the Word of God and we do live in some very serious times for this country and the world because of negative volition and a great deal of it has to do with a culture of arrogance. And this is what we'll be studying along with uh, continuing in Acts. Turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 verse 12. We'll do a little review before moving on. And this will be a little shorter than the hour and 20 minutes. So I can cut it shorter. I got to go to work anyway. Acts chapter 2 12. Amazed and perplexed. Who, who's amazed and perplexed? These are those who are hearing in their own language uh, someone uh, speaking to them who should not know their language. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Now this part is the response of those who were positive to the message. And that's because they said, what does it mean? They wanted to know. And we are, and as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are motivated by what we do know, and we're motivated by what we do not know. When we are growing spiritually and we are spiritual babes, most of our motivation comes from what we do not know. And then when we are uh, moving up to play Roma, we are mostly motivated by what we do know, and still motivated by what we don't know. So there you see the increase. And motivation and at any point along the way there's a danger zone where people get a little doctrine and they think they know it all and they go off all off into arrogance they don't want to know what this means and that means anymore they already know what it means but they don't then in Acts chapter 2 13 it says this some however made fun of them and said they've had too much alcohol and drugs it was it was called new wine you could say it was for the new feast but uh, they were acting so out of their heads and they did have narcotics that they put in their their wine especially for those who were ill and uh, nothing's new under the sun uh, they had medication for those who were ill and then you would get uh, some drug addict come along and get a little bit of that mix it with his wine and you had that stuff going on then uh, just as much as today, if not more so, uh, the people of Israel were always known to sublimate with uh, alcohol and drugs. So they said, they've had too much wine. And this means this is the negative response of those blinded by religiosity. Now those under the religiosity, they would drink. Oftentimes, I've read the history of the Pharisee and the Pharisee was highly glorified and a lot of people wouldn't take one step they wouldn't do anything without visiting their rabbi and asking their rabbi if it was okay to do thus and so and thus and so but they better not go see their rabbi at nine in the morning he's got a hangover and uh, they drank freely and they're the first to accuse and so this showed the negative response of those blinded by religiosity. Now suddenly we come across Peter, filled with God the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, it's the first day he's had any, any relationship with God the Holy Spirit whatsoever. It was offered endowment and he ignored it. But then when he received it, then you see power. Now that should tell you something. You might go out working for the Lord, as you would call it, in the energy of the flesh. And you might have a pleasant personality and you think you're good and you talk to people nicely. And you may mention the Lord here and there and use the holy language here and there. But what you have when you have the power of the Spirit is something totally different. Now, Peter would go around and uh, do just as most believers today do without the filling and uh, fake it. 
Well, you don't have to fake it under the power of the Spirit because it's not your power anymore. God the Holy Spirit, in essence, takes over. You say, what do you mean? I'm possessed by the Holy Spirit? Well, there's nothing better to be possessed by, I guess. But no, you still have your volition. You can still sin, and then the power, the effective power of God the Holy Spirit is grieved. It doesn't mean all the power is gone, but it is diminished. Uh, and you grieve the Spirit, lie to the Spirit, quench the Spirit, but the Spirit's still there. <laughs> But here we have Peter filled with God the Holy Spirit, the fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And uh, during this series, I'm going to have to go back into some parts of Matthew to show you what a knucklehead Peter was. You won't believe it unless I show it to you. I remember when my pastor, where he would say, and the Catholics, they put up all the... Uh, and, and they honor all of the disciples. And he said, those were the dumbest people on the face of the earth. And at the time, I would think, uh, I would think, well, they were disciples, the dumbest people. I, I thought it was, I don't know. I just thought maybe he was exaggerating until I grew more in grace. And I realized not only was he not exaggerating, I could say a lot more about them. They were idiots, all of them except for... John. John seemed to have it pretty straight, but even John did not ask for the endowment, though offered. So now under the Spirit, we see a completely different Peter. And I do have uh, something that I made years ago, a personality profile on Peter. I'll bring that out tonight during class. And uh, we will see that the personality profile of Peter, how he acted, impulsive arrogance, uh, shifting from bravery, feigned bravery, false, pseudo, and then going into cowardice. And uh, But the one thing about Peter, he was positive and he was a plugger. And even though he would go out of bounds every now and then, he respected authority. If you don't respect authority, you're lost. You will never accept the authority of any pastor, and you will be a loser in the unique spiritual life. Hence the importance of getting under your right pastor, and if you can't accept the authority of your right pastor, you're doomed. Now, Peter was a real screw-up and arrogant himself. We all have hang-ups we have to get over, and so did Peter. And Peter oftentimes would be arrogant, and he would try to instruct the Lord Almighty. How did our Lord handle it? Well, you don't see it too much in the English. In the English, you might uh, hear him say, now, Peter, or, you know, something that is uh, not so harsh. And when you're reading over it, you're not listening to voice inflection because you're reading. And anytime you read, try to put the voice inflection with it. What are they saying? How are they saying it? I'll tell you how he said it. Uh, Peter would say something uh, stupid, and uh, for example, our Lord, our Lord asked them all, all the disciples, "Can you drink from the cup that I can drink from?" And they all said, "Yes, Lord." What he was talking about was, "Can you all bear the sins of the world as I'm about to do?" And Peter was the first to speak up and say, "Yes, Lord, I'll do it." He had no clue. He was dumb. He didn't know the fact that our, he didn't even, he knew it, but he couldn't even put it together in his mind to say, yes, Lord, you must die on the cross as a substitute for all of us. He knew it from scripture, but he could not remember it. Why not? No helper. No paracletos. And you want to know something? Jesus Christ is the greatest doctrinal teacher ever, of course. But not even Jesus Christ could get through these knuckleheads without another power, the power of God the Holy Spirit. And so God the Holy Spirit entered into Peter along with 120 other believers on that day, on the Jewish Pentecost. It's Jewish, all Jews being all believing Jews being filled 
with God the Holy Spirit. And so I was going to say something about something else uh, Peter did that was really dumb. He Sometimes he just had a silly attitude. And that goes away when you have the filling of the Spirit plus the intake of Bible doctrine. For example, during the uh, time our Lord had not yet been resurrected, but he was showing the disciples what it's going to be like. They call it the transfiguration. And during the transfiguration, our Lord uh, assumed the resurrection body. And for a moment, just to give an idea to his students what it's going to be like. And not only that, you could hear, not see, but hear God the Father speaking. And uh, also... Uh, Moses came along, or Elijah. I've forgotten which, maybe both. Either Moses or maybe Moses and Elijah. I think Elijah came along. And here they are, and they come down, and the whole point of it is for the disciples to put their eyes on Christ. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, the song goes, and that's a good one. The occupation with Christ. The whole point was so Peter would stare at a glorified Lord Jesus Christ of with whom he had walked. And do you know, he, he, he was impressed, of course, a little bit, but he was, uh, he must have not been that impressed because automatically he's trying to set up a campfire and he wants to go camping with the uh, Lord and Transfiguration and with God the Father and with Elijah. And now you have to understand, uh, God the Father's in heaven, Elijah's in heaven. They're not going to come down and start helping Peter build a tent and then spend the night with him so he can go down and tell everybody, I spent the night with the transfigured Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, I got to spend the night with Elijah. Now, of course, God the Father would not be part of that. And it shows Peter at this point, without the Spirit and having evil thoughts even, he was more impressed with being able to have a little campsite with Elijah than he was with the glorified Jesus Christ in transfiguration, or at least an image of how it would be. His eyes were to be straight on the Lord, and he was to listen to everything our Lord was saying, but he was distracted. Even then, now you don't tell me that's not uh, an idiot. That's dumb. But there's something about Peter. He didn't get arrogant. Because our Lord was speaking. And then Peter was chewed out by God the Father. And he said to Peter, Peter. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Concentrate on him. Now that's coming from God the Father, and that had to uh, send shivers right down the spine of Peter. Now I know some people who would uh, receive a rebuke, and if they received a rebuke from God even, they would immediately become angry. No one rebukes them. No one talks to them that way, especially when it comes to any type of authority. If you've worked anywhere, lately nobody works, so this analogy might not work anymore. But back during the Bush days when everybody had a job, think back to then. And you had a job. Guess what? Everybody talked against authority. Didn't like authority. Good authority, bad authority, didn't matter. And here's Peter, not thinking about the authority of the Lord, but more interested in receiving the approbation of his friends back down there when he can go back and say, I spent the night with Elijah. Isn't that awesome? Peter, you've been spending the night with the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, every day. What's your issue? Your eyes are not on the Lord. That's your issue. And that is the issue with believers today. Distracted. Distracted. And we have the power of the Spirit if we rebound. Now, Peter has an excuse. He has no relationship with the Spirit. So he really has an excuse to be an idiot. 
You don't. Who, where do you focus your attention? Uh, somebody wrote a comment on uh, my website thing on Facebook, and they quoted Psalms, where David said, On thy doctrine I meditate both day and night. Now that is turning your eyes upon Jesus. Because it was the Lord Jesus Christ who glorified the word of God above his very own name. So when you're taking in Bible doctrine, your eyes are on the Lord. Where are your eyes right now? And this is between you and God. Uh, we always slip up. I don't have to tell you that I do. You should know I do. But we all slip up and get our eyes on something else. And we're not always thinking about all the marvelous things the Lord's done done for us. And sometimes we go on vacation and get excited about something. And, or you go to Vegas and you're excited that you're winning and then you lose it all. And uh, you weren't thinking about the Lord the whole time. And then after you lose it all, you start thinking about the Lord and recovering your money by working. Really the only way to make it. It's the way God designed it. Although there's a few who are very smart who who can get away with uh, some type of uh, professional gambling, but some of them even have lost out in the end, and then they start over and try it again and go back up. But uh, that's a whole other subject. My what I'm telling you is where where where's your focus? You can be distracted in so many ways and not even know it, and then once you you know, the eight stages of reversionism. I've taught those mechanics many times. Can you name them off the top of your head without looking at your notes? Well, first of all, you have reaction and distraction. You react to the word of God or you react to the pastor because he said something that you didn't like or he said something that someone else didn't like who had influence over you, etc. That happens all the time. There'd be groups in Baraka, cliques would form, uh, the colonel would chew, chew out one person in the clique, and the whole clique is gone, and the whole clique loses out their spiritual life. They chose people over doctrine. What a, what a pathetic thing. People are no damn good. You don't choose some person over Bible doctrine. Have you lost your mind? Do you know what people are like? People, well, when you're dealing with their stream of consciousness, they are deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. And you want to go with a group of people or one person in particular, a person desperately wicked above all things, when you can have a relationship with the perfect Lord Jesus Christ who has a love for you that you cannot even understand, We'll understand it in heaven, and that will be a source of great bliss. But here's our Lord died on the cross as a substitute for every one of us. Went through extraordinary pain that we cannot understand. And you get your eyes on a person. And are distracted from Bible doctrine. Now that's not to say you can't have relationships. And acquaintances, that's normal in life. You're not to be a hermit. But the principle is you can have relationships in life and you can have friendships in life so long as it does not become a distraction to your spiritual life. When I was in high school, I knew, I knew a fellow. He would talk to me when we would wait on the bus quite often. And uh, we would discuss certain things. I can't remember what, but I remember one discussion we had. And I found out in a New York minute that he was anti-Semitic. And you know how kids are always into cliques or I want a friend, I want this or that. I did not, I ignored that boy. He was a boy, a teenager, maybe 17, 18. I ignored him. I never said one more word to him. And he knew why. Because as soon as he became anti-Semitic, I said, I don't believe that, and I walked away. And that was it. 
Now that could have been a distraction if I was more impressed with having a friendship than having a friendship with the Lord, as it were. There's something wrong. Well, there wasn't anything wrong with my spiritual life. Plus, I knew uh, lightning strikes those who go anti-Semitic. And if you want to know, uh, over these next few months, even into the next year, if, if you want to see some severe punishment, not just to this country, but if you want to see severe punishment to people who are anti-Semitic, you just keep an eye out on a certain person and everything he touches turns into a big pile of doggy dung that stinks to high heavens. That's what happens. When you curse the Jew, you're cursed. And anyone, no matter in power or not, you curse the Jew, everything you touch will turn to crap and your life will become miserable. So I ran from that. But see, you have these distractions. You can have distractions because of people. That's where most people get their distractions, other people, because social life is enjoyable. It is a stimulant. And some people are, frankly, addicted to social life. If you were to sit them at home alone for a week, if you were to, if everybody were to leave, their family left and all their friends left and went on vacation and they were left at home for a week and they happen not to be working that week and they're just sitting around, some people will go insane. They'll go into withdrawals. They'll start crying in depression. Now that's an addiction. What are you addicted to? The stimulation of people. That's a sublimation. And if you can't sit down for one day by yourself, contained in your own thoughts, and especially in the United States with all the entertainment around, if you're not able to entertain yourself and you always have to have somebody with you while you're being entertained, you have your priorities all mixed up. Now, there's nothing wrong with Facebook, but Facebook is another outlet where people can go and uh, talk to people. Facebook is a wonderful place where usually people who don't have much of a social life, I'm talking about the ugly, the ugly can go there and have a social life and be stimulated and get addicted. And uh, with all of the nonsense that goes on there, and then Christians will go on there and they will call it Christian Fellowship, and they'll spend all their time glorifying each other and building each other up. And then forget, oh, I missed Bible class. But it's okay because most pastors are teaching what? Wednesday and Sunday? A few teach Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday. That's better. So you, and then you miss one. Oh, I'll get it the next time. So you're getting it what? Once a week? Be honest with yourself. You say, no, no, no. There's 50 different pastors out here I can listen to. And while I'm talking to all my friends and not listening, I'll play this person in the background. And you know what you've lost out on? The authority of the Word of God. Because we don't understand authority in this country whatsoever. Why is it that a man... Sometimes a short, bald, uh, pot-bellied man, at least how it's described in the Acts of Thessalonica, I don't know if it's true or not. But let's say it is true. And here's this short man. Most people never really pay much attention to short man. He can't be in authority, etc. But there are exceptions. Apostle Paul, Napoleon Bonaparte. I went out bowling last night, and they were all calling me Napoleon. Yeah, I'm sure. And uh, I laughed. you got to be able to poke fun at yourself. And then, but the point is, here's the Apostle Paul. And he comes out, and he turns the world upside down. Now, why would God pick a man to do this? 
I mean, why doesn't he just come down here? And if you are positive toward the word, I mean, he's God. He can do anything he wants. And if he wanted a system, he could come straight to us and say, or, you know, just send a message to us. This is what you need to do. Or he might or come give a sermon. This is what you need to do. And he's Jesus Christ, so you understand the authority, maybe. But he instituted men. God, the Holy Spirit, gave the gift of pastor teacher to men, men, men. And that's in the Bible. And I will not stray from the Bible. And I don't care how annoyed or pissed off any woman gets. Because it's in there. And I'm going to teach it. And I'll tell you why. You say, well, why is that? Why can't I be a pastor? For first of all, why do you want to be one? You have some type of weird power was. That's why. I didn't wake up one day and say, you know what? I want to be pastor teacher. I woke up one day and I said, I have a gift of communication. I knew that. But I didn't do a thing about it. I wasn't even ready. And I knew I had the gift of communication for, I don't know, 12 years before I even stood behind a pulpit. And there was no real desire to go into it for some power and to be praised. Because if you're doing it the right way, you receive compliments from the positive, And nowadays, that's the few. And you receive a lot of hell from others. Now, you women, you want to get up there and teach and have a lot of other women follow you. You want to be the big mother hen. And your motivation's all off. And do you know what that's called in scripture? Lying to God, the Holy Spirit. And that is bringing you dangerously close to the fifth cycle, uh, to uh, dying the sin face to face with death. And we will study that in Acts chapter 5. And so there are power mad people and they want the gift, etc. But that's not how it works. God, the Holy Spirit, bestows the gift and he does not give it to women. You ladies have wonderful spiritual gifts. There you say, but that's not fair. The man gets a spiritual gift, an extra one then, because uh, he has one we can't have. Wrong! Hey. There's a special gift for you, too, that you may not have realized, and I'll give you the Greek, poimen didaskalos. If you know what Greek, you know what didaskalos is, teacher. It strips away the authority so you can't stand behind a pulpit, but you can have a gift of teacher. Not only that, they put poimen, poimen. Didaskalos, meaning mature. And, the, and this is one of those gifts that will only function properly, of course, as all of them. When you are, once you pass that door of hope, once you get through the door of confidence, and then you, with your humility, now some women will listen to this and they'll all run around saying, I'm a poimain to Daskalos. I'm going to teach women here and there and everywhere how to love their children and their husband. First of all, look in the mirror. Do you love your child Do you, or children? Do you love your husband? And what will happen is if you're out of fellowship, even if you have the gift and you go out of fellowship, your poimain to Daskalos will be Let's get together and gossip about each other's husbands. And because women are responders, they're either responding or reacting. Those who have the gift of poem main to Daskalos, when that gift is functioning properly, they are responding to Bible doctrine and hence responding to their husband and therefore having a natural affection toward their own children. I don't know whether you realize it. If you're a woman, you know it. Women can be viciously cruel just as much as a man. Now, it's true that 70% or 80% of most violent crime and murders is occurred by men. 
And that's because men are arrogant and they have their own area of aggression and especially streaks of jealousy. And uh, we have a lot of men not even working today, letting the women run things. So this isn't a racist thing or racist. It's not a gender thing nor a racist thing. It has to do we are made differently. And when you're not responding, you're reacting. When, when you're reacting, you become cruel. All women who are reacting become extremely cruel with words. And that's why there's nothing worse than a woman scorned. A, a smart woman, even a dumb woman, can hit a man right where it hurts and hit his buttons because a woman knows that in marriage, a man has an area of sensitivity called arrogance. Now, it may not be functioning, but she'll poke it, and all of a sudden it comes out. Insult you slyly in some way. Does it on purpose? Now, I don't know if, now, if you're fighting all the time, in, in some cases, I'll just give you a little advice, no extra charge, I just know what happens. Some women like to start fights because they want attention. And oftentimes it's because the leader in the marriage hasn't been giving enough attention. So she thinks, I'm going to get attention some way. So she'd rather have him yell at her to hear his voice at least. At least he's paying her some attention. And that's true. You can ask any woman. You can go ask your wife. And she'll say, yeah, that's true. That is in a normal situations. So sometimes you can cut out all that fighting by just giving a little bit of a tension now and then. And that's no extra charge. But now, before I go to work, let me start hammering some things here related to God the Holy Spirit and what he did in Peter's life. Now, Peter before was in impulsive arrogance. And he wouldn't know what to say if he stood up in front of a crowd. He would be nervous. He would be all upset, shooken up. He would be saying all the wrong things. And uh, he just wouldn't be able to do it. But now the Spirit rested upon him, and he's filled with the Spirit. And then we have these words in verse 14. Then Peter stood up. That has meaning. He stood up. That's poise. When you speak, you stand up. Now, I sit down because you can't see me. And the microphone is closer to my mouth this way. But sometimes I stand up. So he stood up. And he also stood up with the 11, the other disciples. And then he raised his voice. And he had to raise it very loud because there is a large group of people who have come out to see what the big sonic boom was about. Today, we'd all be looking skyward and say, was it an F-18, F-16, did a jet crash? What's going on? Well, they didn't have anything like that. So they were looking upward thinking, did a meteor come down? Is God trying to talk to us? Well, the second part's right. God's trying to talk to you. And so they all came out to hear this, to see what the sonic boom was all about. And then Peter stands up. And he stands up, and when he stands up, he's the leader at this point. All the 11 follow and stand up. You know how if you watch TV, you'll see uh, any type of uh, station, you may see a man stand up behind a pulpit, and you'll see about 11 people behind him looking at him, or, and they look like a bodyguard or something. Well, that's about how it was. Peter stood up, then the 11 stood up behind him. And then he raised his voice. Now he had to because of the crowd. So they could listen. And uh, sometimes there's a reason why a pastor has to raise his voice. And a lot of people don't like it. And one thing I've noticed is women being responders, they don't like it. Probably because it reminds them of their husband when he gets upset with them. And I understand that because... Uh, where I work, sometimes I'll re it's customer service. Sometimes I'll receive a call from some snippety, you know what I want to say, some woman, uh, a witch 
just replace the W with a B. And she'll start right in and sound psychotic, not give you, not let you help, not let you get a word in edgewise. And all of a sudden, I'll have a flashback to wife. And I don't like that woman anymore. Now, she might be legitimately mad about something. I, not that you ever have a right to be angry. But what I'm saying is, I don't want to hear that. I have to. It's my job. So, what? guess what? Flip on the impersonal love. Or you could call it professional love. And I've done so 99.9% .9 of the time, except one time I had a flashback. And I thought, wife, wife, I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. I'm a human being. And it's funny. And then immediately I uh, raised my voice and I told her I am trying. I'm not going to raise it now and tell you exactly. I, I didn't cuss or anything or do anything that would get me fired, but I made it very clear that she was going to calm down in a very forceful manner. And you know what? She did. But anyway, uh, oftentimes women don't like to hear that yelling. They associate it with arrogance because... Uh, they might have married an arrogant man, and all he does is bully her around all the time. Or she may just be rebellious, and she's never heard a man yell at her. I think that's what happened uh, to the person I was talking to on the phone. She had had no one had ever stood up to her, and when finally somebody says, Look, lady, I've been nice to you. There's no reason for you to be talking like this to me. Cool it. And she did. I bet nobody's ever talked to her that way. But those with the negative response had to concentrate. And this is where we go, and I'll go on, and we'll start hitting it faster now. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Concentrate on what I have to say. Now, he had to say that because all the legalists or the those involved in religiosity, they're always rude. And all they were doing was mocking still and saying, ah, these people are drunk. These people are stoned out of their heads. Ah, <laughs> this is stupid. And they were all having a grand time about it. And so Peter comes up and says, let me explain this to you. And then there's great emphasis on this area. Concentrate on what I have to say. Then he explains, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, Peter was a hard-working fisherman and too poor to have alcohol in the morning. Only the rich could have alcohol in the morning and only the Pharisees. So he says it's only nine in the morning. And... Uh, and God the Holy Spirit did not lead Peter to say this because it wasn't the issue. But if he wanted to be a smart butt, he would say, it's only nine in the morning. And you know that only the Pharisees have enough money to drink at that time. But no, he did not say that. That wasn't part of what God the Holy Spirit wanted him to say because drunkenness wasn't the issue. He stayed away from that issue. He just said, no, nope, they're not drunk. And now he's going to explain. But first of all, I want you to note the difference between Acts 2.13 and 2.14. In Acts 2.13, they said, or actually, let's go back. In Acts 2.12, and we're going to make a distinction between Acts 2.12 and Acts 2.13. In Acts 2.12, uh, those with uh, a, well, they had a positive response. So Peter did not need to... Uh, do anything with them except because he he had the gift of interpretation. Everyone else who had the gift of tongues, they were already being witnessed to, and they were already being saved by the thousands. So Peter turns to those who are negative. Why? Why didn't he say, these people are negative, I give up on that? Why did he say, I don't have to yell or shout or anything? I'll just go over with the fellow believers over here. Because every personality is different. Everybody has a different background. And if you've been raised, I mean raised in religion, it has an effect on your life, on your thinking. 
Sometimes it has such an effect that you have a hang up for 20, 30 years, even while listening to doctrine until finally it's flushed out because religion is the devil's ace trump and it's a handicap. And those raised in religion have just as much right to hear the gospel as those who were raised under antinomian types or the, the liberal type who just let people live free and live and let live. That rarely happened in Israel. But, in, but for those who were coming into Israel, that was their culture. Now, the people in Israel, their culture is, you do what we say. We are power mad, and you follow every stupid rule, every taboo I put out there. So those with a negative response had to concentrate instead of disrupt, and that's why Peter said, concentrate. Up until this point, they had been mocking all those who had received God the Holy Spirit. They mocked them as early morning drunks and drug abusers. In other words, they were basically calling them uh, homeless drug addicts, homeless alcoholics, and laughing about it. Now that's cruelty. Religion is cruel. Why laugh about it? You know, I've been, I've walked out, especially nowadays with the economy being bad, and sometimes I'll walk to uh, during lunch to go somewhere, and you'll see a drunk here and there on the street. They look unhealthy. Uh, they think they're trying to make themselves happy, but they've drank too much, and they just look unhealthy and miserable, but they'll, they'll talk to you. And I have compassion for those. I have compassion. And any normal person does. Now, of course, they say, go out and get a job. What job? Where is there a job? Now, I'm not saying the drunk just sitting around drinking is right. He's wrong. But he's no more wrong than this religious crowd. And I have compassion for the religious crowd because that's how they were raised and that's all they know. But as you see from the religious crowd, no compassion. But Peter has compassion even from those who hate Peter. And eventually you'll see him uh, get beaten half to death. So in the following passage... Peter uses an illustration concerning the eschatological dispensations of the millennium and the second advent. And it's not an interpretation. It's an illustration. And you can do that. Uh, what From a dispensation, you can do that. You can have an illustration, but not a correct interpretation, because he wasn't trying to interpret the passage. He was trying to make a point that things like this can occur. So then in verse 16, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, referencing the second advent. And then he goes on, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. Now, this isn't a salvation message. I think last night I may have made it as such. I knew better. It was late and I was probably sleepy. This is not a salvation message. This is dealing with what occurs during the tribulation. And everyone who calls on the name, because you see in the previous verse, verse 20, it's talking about the sun turning to darkness, the blood, the moon turning to blood or looking as blood. And then the Lord comes. And then it says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, who are those? They're, well, they're already believers. And those who call on the name of the Lord will be the mature believers in the tribulation. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, mature believers, will be delivered. Delivered from what? Delivered from the violence of the tribulation. With few exceptions except for those 
who are to be martyred, and surely they have their reward. Then in verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Now this is where he gets bold. Now I'll tell you something. You, you don't talk to a Pharisee this way. The Pharisee spent eight years being educated and then spent his whole life continuing to educate himself, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And here's Peter. He doesn't have a degree. He's beginning to learn how to read now. But he has no degree. He didn't go to school. He went fishing. That sounds like more fun to me anyway. And a lot of people today, in their arrogance, instead of listening to Bible doctrine, don't you have any discernment for yourself? Instead of listening to Bible doctrine, they will say, oh, this pastor here, where was he ordained? Look, you can get ordained from a magazine nowadays. What does it matter? In fact, I need to be ordaining people. They don't need to be ordaining me. I know what I'm talking about. And uh, the issue of ordination was put in as part of ecclesiastical ritual that is used so that a bunch of idiots don't uh, rise, uh, a bunch of idiots don't have a stamp of approval from someone who is a great, great pastor. So in other words, if you're a great pastor, uh, only ordain those you know very well etc. But even then, you don't know. They can change their volition. I'll tell you one thing. At the moment I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, I was ordained by God. And there's no higher authority. So if you want to have that attitude, go to someone who's ordained and talks about flowers, lilies, bonnets, bunnies, and all the sweet things that you, the, you uh, of Mother's Day and how wonderful life is and how the Lord's going to get you through it and how all things work together for good and then he stops and doesn't give you the rest and how you need to invite Christ into your heart and into your life. And if you don't do that, at least invite him to your barbecue. Invite him to your, uh, invite him somewhere. See how stupid it is? And I'm illustrating absurdity by being absurd. Because you might say, oh, you're blaspheming. No, you're a spiritually dead person, which means you can't invite Christ anywhere. Not into your life, not into your heart, not into your callus, not into your feet. Nowhere, not into your home. You're as stupid as Peter. Inviting Elijah to stay in a tent when he's up in heaven. Dumb! And you say, whoa, you're awful tough. I don't like hearing that. Well, let me tell you how you have to be with the recalcitrant. Those who are negative, and they do respond. But they're not going to respond with the sweetness in life, or light. They respond when someone tells it like it is to them because they have never heard it that way before and that and some of these some of these will be shocked into believing into Christ and I'll show you that here we go this is where I'll close then I got to run out the door all right we're on verse 22 acts 2:22 and I'm just going to read what Peter said in the manner in which he said it, and remember, he's already raising his voice, and at this point, he's becoming louder. And at this point, he has turned away from those who are positive, and he's staring eyeball to eyeball with those who were earlier laughing and mocking and calling his fellow believers, Peter's fellow believers, drunks and alcoholics and uh, drug addicts. So what does he say? And isn't it funny how cruel that he can be? But you better not straighten him out. But under the power of the Spirit, this is what Peter's going to do. Otherwise, Peter would have never done that. There are passages in the past where he would have went along with the legalist. Sit at their table, not with the Gentiles. He's over that now. God the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. 
And, and the reason why it can happen is because he absorbed these things academically while our Lord taught for three years as the greatest teacher ever. He knew it academically. He just could never put it into practice. So he always acted stupid. Then God the Holy Spirit came along and now it, it suddenly metabolizes at a rate that you can't believe. And God, the Holy Spirit, is bringing back to his memory many things. And not only that, when you're filled with the power of the Spirit, guess what? As it says in Timothy. The filling of the Spirit, it's not a spirit of timidity, but of power. And here it is. Fellow Israelites, in other words, religious types, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. They were all there. They saw it. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you... Now, he's staring eyeball to eyeball with some of the highest ranking religious people in Israel. Now, let me tell you something. This is the power of the spirit. Anyone else would be terrified because they have the right to flog. And if they could get away with it, murder you. But he's not scared. Once you have the filling of the spirit and you've metabolized that much doctrine, you're not scared of anything. Of course, there are things that startle you just because you're a normal person with a nervous system. But that doesn't necessarily mean fear. And I can tell you right now, I'm not scared of a thing. And at this point, neither is Peter. Verse 23. This man was handed over to you. By God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. So he stared at them and, and told them, you murdered the Lord Jesus Christ. You murdered the God man. And it's going to shock them. And many of those religious people will believe So when a pastor is led by the Holy Spirit, such as Peter as an apostle is led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit knows what he's doing. And the Holy Spirit will guide that pastor. Sometimes I've been in messages before where I'm, I've, I've got it all set out and I've been studying it and I'm ready to give it. And all of a sudden I realize I've gotten through half the page that I was going to study. And that's because something came up. Uh, God, the Holy Spirit brought it to my mind. And I said, somebody needs to hear this. I don't say it. It's all unconscious. And it just goes in that direction. Well, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of studying these things. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.